Welcome to the Slade Ham Experiment, everybody. I remember to press record this time. You don't know. You don't. You don't know what happened before this. Maybe this is the first take. Maybe. I mean, it is. But there were about two minutes in there where I was happily plugging along, introducing you to the midnight spaceship. We're taking a daytime ride. You can't tell. Another thing you can't tell. There's so much mystery on the outside of this box, isn't there? What's on either side? What's going on in the person's life when they hit stop? How many people do we digitally just interact like that with? And then it flips off and they just disappear. Do they disappear for real? Are they just non-player characters in this simulation? All right, let's not get weird this early. I've been on social media a lot more lately. Gearing up, April 2nd, special comes out right here on this channel. Hey, are you subbed? You should be. Look, the reason I haven't been on, we've talked about Ed, ad nauseum. However, watching people interact now, it makes me realize, like when you're away from something for a while and then you step back, you're like, oh, fresh eyes. Do we not collectively understand that we, we live together? It seems as if that has been missed. Like, for all of the fighting and the arguing and the surface stuff that is obviously there, it seems like we're not addressing the fact that we are roommates. Everybody, do you know that? Hi, I'm Slade. I live down the hall. We share a living room. Did you know that? Did you know you're leaving your shit all over the living room? Did, did you know? Do you know you have a room that you, when your friends come over, y'all can go hang out? Because that's, and then this space, we can also share and talk, and you can show me what you and your dumb friends are talking about and what you're into. And I go, oh, that's neat. Or, oh, that's stupid. Or, oh, I'm going to go back to, to watching TV. But this space is shared. Maybe, maybe get your shoes out of the refrigerator. Maybe we don't live like that. We act like everybody, like we have a right. That's what it looks like to me. The whole front page of social media, people screaming and yelling because they're convinced they're the ones who get to decorate the living room. I'm going to put my racist paintings on this wall over here. All right, but all of the trans artwork goes on the left wall. We have such demands, and I get it, right? We're, we're human beings. At our core, we want to be, be seen. We want to be recognized, certainly. I understand that emotion. I feel it in my own way, in my own industry. That's what humanity is. All of us clawing and fighting to go, do you see me? Do you, does the way... I see the world make sense to you. Am I wrong? Am I crazy? Am I walking up the wrong fucking mountain? That's what we're doing. And then in the last 20 years or so, what have we done? We, we legitimized that. We gave it a place that you, could, that you could do that publicly. We opened up the living room. We said, we'll be back. Y'all hang out here for a second. And I don't know, maybe we just didn't come back fast enough. Maybe someone wasn't paying attention. But in that short period of time of being left alone in the living room, man, y'all moved the furniture around, changed the decor, invited your friends over, threw a party. What did we do? We, we tore this place apart. And now we're like, this is my house. We got squatter's rights or something. No, we don't. We have an obligation to one another to cohabitate. With all of our dumb ideologies and all of the weird shit we believe. We got to find a way to make that work. Maybe. Maybe this generation. I'll blame it on a generational thing. But maybe the people living in this current time. Are under such financial duress that. They've never had enough time living away from their parents to know what it's like to have a roommate. I don't know. Living with your parents isn't the same as having a roommate. 
you can do whatever you want to at your house. I'm sure they got rules, blah, blah, blah. But that living room's yours. I, I lived alone and have lived alone for a significant part of my adult life. I had my ex that I lived with for just shy of eight years. There were rules there, right? But we agreed on, on what the living room and the house, you know, we were, we were in lockstep there. I've had roommates twice for very short periods of time. One was pretty wonderful, man. I think I've talked about it before. We had opposite schedules. I was, I was gone from about 6 or 7 p.m. until about 5 a.m. He had a regular job. We'd get up at 6 in the morning. Wouldn't get home till 6 p.m. We never saw each other. And then I'm like the most private dude in the world. You'll never see me. I'm a ghost. I moved into that house. I had a couch and furniture and a bunch of stuff. It populated the living room. I don't think I ever went in there. My TV, all that, just stayed in there. I had a master bedroom, master bath, and it was a big enough bedroom that I had, like, all my bed furniture, like, asleep and stuff, and then I had a whole desk and a work area. It was huge. We never saw each other, but the living room was never messy. That dude never left stuff around. I never left stuff around. If we didn't occasionally see each other's cars in the driveway, we would have never even known we lived together. That was good. That was respect. Hey, man, you got your dumb stuff? I got my dumb stuff. Let's try not to let our dumb stuff bump into each other. Good, good. All right. The only other time I had a roommate. I'm still scratching. Can you see this? This poison ivy on week three. I feel like I'm locked up in Debo's pigeon coop. <laughs> Doing that Friday scratching. All right. Yeah, give a little wiggle when you scratch. I had a roommate. What? Did you just, I didn't say anything to you, you psychopathic AI. My Google's talking to me. Hey, Google, stop whatever it is you're doing. You eavesdropping robotic monster. <sighs> All this technology. I'm going to leave her in the living room. I hope someone steals you. I had this roommate. Was an it was an interesting scenario because I moved in with him. I had come back. This is after I went to Dallas. I had moved back from Dallas. And this dude had bartended with me. And he had an extra room at this apartment complex. And he goes, come on, man. Because you can have it. And this was my first real time having a place that I was, that I, like I paid for and lived there theoretically. Because I'd, I'd live with my mom till you know, I moved out and then I kind of was just crashing with friends and kind of, I didn't really have a place. My stuff was still at my mom's. I just had clothes and stuff in the apartments I was living in. This is the first time I moved everything in. So I had my room. It's the first time I had to contemplate what it would be like living with another human being. I'd never done it like this. Other people, but like just us singularly focused on this one place. And I did not vet this dude. I still check up on his Facebook page every now and again just to make sure he had uh, mowed down uh, a, a bunch of civilians at a market or something. He's... And I say that, he's one of the most steadfast, he was an employee, this guy has stayed in my life for a while, steadfast employee, when I, when I had a club for a while, you could leave a thousand dollars right in front of him, it, it would be, there would be a thousand and one when he got back, oh, there was interest, but living with this dude, this dude had, I didn't know, like he was prepping for, for war, I didn't know, I didn't know he had a closet full of every gun imaginable. And this is before you knew people were really like this, even in Southeast Texas. And he had a bandolier of hand grenades that were on the coffee table one day when I came home. And I'm home, you know, three o'clock in the morning. I've been out drinking or bartending, doing whatever I'm doing. And you come home, you're like, 
Like I think about how badly that might have been, might have gone. Right. I know I'm smart, smart enough, smarter than the person I, I that that I'm in this hypothetical scenario. Right. But imagine coming home drunk, not knowing that the person you're living with has has all this weaponry. So when you see a bandolier of hand grenades on a coffee table and it's three o'clock in the morning and you're hammered and you're like, ah, well, what's going on? All right, you're eating what a burger. Are these hand grenades? Are you kidding me? What I mean, like, you don't think you'd pick one up? Is, is this real? Does this look real? And then you'd kind of want to mess. This is my thought. I'd be like, man, I kind of want to poke and prod and just see. And then there's the pin. And then what if it slipped out? I don't know. This is me. I don't know enough about hand grenades. Is it just a straight? It can't be a straight pin because it would fall out on its own. So it's got to have some kind of barb or whatever. Can you put the pin back in? That's my question. Because what if you, if you're like, what is it? And now you're just stuck with the grenade and the pin. And now you got to go wake up your friend with two closed hands and go, hey, what do you do with it? I turned your hand grenade on. <laughs> I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> Is, is I guess that they when you let go, I don't know the first thing about hand grenades, but I know this dude should have left four of them laying on a coffee table when he knows he has a drunk roommate who may or may not be that smart in, at that time in his life. Surprised you don't ever hear about that. Apartment complex goes up in flames after a hand grenade explosion. <laughs> you got to watch what you leave in, in the living room. You got to watch what you expect other people to tolerate. You're allowed to do whatever you want to in your own dumb bedroom. But you're not you're not allowed to expect the entire rest of the world to watch your dumb TV show while you're at work. Leave it on. Don't change the channel. You're not allowed to redecorate without permission. We all want to sit here. You're not allowed to cook cook food that's going to stain all the pots. And if you do, you got to wash them. And even if you do all of that, you can't expect the rest of us to eat it. That's all. Thank you for the effort. But no, I'm not interested in your weird spices from your home. You have it. I'm going to eat a hot dog. Get your shoes out of the refrigerator. All right. Rant over. Special's coming out. I've been, I had a conversation last night with a friend of mine. He was asking me what my strategy is with the self-release, with some other things, what I'm doing. Most of it centered around clips and how I'm going to start doing exactly what everybody else is doing in their promotional process. My buddy Chase sent me a link. If I hear, I can't remember his name. The comedian. Uh, he's There's a whole... When you realize, right, there's a video, I should link to it, um, and I should have his name handy. That's a mistake. Um, anyway, guy put a, he posted a video about a special he taped, right, and how it's currently being uh, sort of shadow banned because of one of the jokes or some of the language or something. That's a side point. He prefaces the video. He opens it by saying, you know, there's a business model, and he, he just lays it out, man. It's what I've been saying for the last year and a half, you know, right? Two years, whatever it is. Pre like My vision It's right. The dude's like, there, here's the plan, and here's how it works, and if you don't have access to Netflix, YouTube is the business model, and here's what you do, and here's what you do, and, you know, uh, the guy, all these guys who have done it, Joe List and Mark Norman and Shane Gillis, uh, he just rattles them all off, and you know, he Ari Shafir and he goes, you know, so this is the crew and I talk to these guys and they give me all the pointers and all the stuff and I'm going to go on Joe Rogan and here's the podcast journey, you know, and this is the path. This is what you do when you launch a special. These are the shows you go on and these are the people who help you. And there's a guy at YouTube who tells you what to do and helps put the comedy stuff together and gives you the answers and helps you all this shit that to me exists behind closed doors of this. There's always an old boys club. Right. Every time there's a club, every time a door opens, a bunch of I say old boys. It's not always boys. Sometimes it's girls. Sometimes they're young. Sometimes they're old. It doesn't matter. People crowd the entrance. They go in. They set up shop like, you know what I mean? Like they're throwing beanbags at the front of a ticket line or something. 
Nah, man, Black Friday, we got the whole section. They're saving seats. In the meantime, people showing up. Like, I didn't even know y'all were talking about this. Y'all are meeting about this? So you, you do what I do. You go, all right, well, these people clearly know stuff I don't know. I got something that's banging. And when I look at all these things other people have done, I get cock, not cockier, prouder by the day. More confident was what I was trying to say. But they're all going through the same process. They're all fighting and clawing for the same thing. And I, when I see, when I see the animals start to run, you ever seen a group of animals make, make a sudden change in direction and you don't know why? I was in Roatan one time. I'll probably never be able to go back to this spot. It used to be so beautiful. This one little edge on West Bay. It's now like the Grand Roatan Resort or something. And it's huge and they bought the mountain and now they're building up. It's way, uh, it's not what it used to be. But this one little spot, there's these cliffs because it's the edge of the island. There's a there's a little bay. Oh, man, I'm reminiscing now. You walk down and it's just sand, 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 then seagrass, and that's where all the octopuses play at night. And then and then it goes into a reef. But the rocks are, are populated by all these iguana. And and where you stay is a little bit up the cliff mountain, and then there's a pathway. I was coming down one day. I was going down and it's bright sunny. I'm going down to the beach. And about four thousand iguana come scurrying up the cliff all up the path like my feet covered in iguanas like you remember when when those little dinosaurs on jurassic park ate all this anyway they just kind of mobbed me like ants run around man what is going on 30 minutes later downpour maybe not 30 i don't know the math i don't know how fast iguana reaction time is but a measurable period of time later downpour out of nowhere their little iguana ears measuring changes in barometric pressure or whatever. So when I see the animals start to move, I'm very hesitant to run also. I don't want to be caught in a great white fire escape. You know what I mean? That's how you get jammed up at the door, running where they run. You hear a gunshot in a crowd. Everybody darts somewhere. It's not the way to react. That is reactive, not the answer. So when the animals start to run, I like to sit in the tall grass and wait. That's where I'm at right now. That's where I've been. Not clawing, fighting, scrapping for the same stuff. And this stubbornness that I have I have maintained this willingness, this unwillingness to go run with all the animals. You tell yourself is a good thing. That's the, and it is, it's a positive trait. Make no mistake. But also, if you, stubbornness without guidance can be, can be this weird sort of non-progressive loop you can get yourself into. And this, in some instances, is helpful. And in some instances, it's not. The, the way it's helpful, right, if you can find something to do, something that doesn't necessarily have any real tangible returns, that's what I'm always talking about with your art, right? You got to do it because you love it. Do it because you love it. Get in there. Do it because you love it. Don't be attached to the outcome. If you can do that, then some things that you do, that you spend time on, that have no perceptible returns to you or your peers can keep you in the game long enough. Like life support. Keep you doing something long enough to not get caught up doing something else. I can't tell you how many friends I have who who have known in comedy great people, really funny people, but they didn't have something they were consistently doing. So when the rough times came, when the rocks showed up in the water, they said, oh, I'm just going to jump out real quick. 
and portage the boat. We're going to set it down. I'm going to I'm going to walk. They get out till the water clears, but then they build a fire and then they make some tea. And then they go, well, I can fish. And then they pull in a fish and then they build a house. And then next thing you know, they live there. I'm like, oh, but get back in the in the boat. They're like, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't really. I don't really do that anymore. Some people were like, all right, well, water's rocky. I'm just going to keep swimming. I'm going to keep rowing, keep doing whatever I got to do. And not really going anywhere. You ever been there in the water? Well, you don't have anything. You can you just the horizon. I've done that in a kayak where you're out in the ocean and you can orient yourself where you really don't have a point of reference, anything but the horizon. And if you row, you can't tell if you're going anywhere. If you're in the water like that and you're you're swimming, you can kind of feel the current, you can kind of feel the waves, you can kind of feel the wind, but if you don't have a point of reference, you don't really know. But in the back of your mind, you have to keep telling yourself that if you stop that swimming, if you stop that rowing, you will sink. You will drown. You will be a thing that no longer lives on the surface of the water. You will be a thing that lives at the bottom. I don't want to live at the bottom. So over the last two and a half decades, I've done a lot of stuff that you could say has no real return. When you're a comic... There's multiple ways to do it, but it's easy to do the route I took. This is my route. I was a, I'm was a journeyman. I'm a mercenary. Put me up in front of people. What I do is ephemeral. It disappears, fades away, gone quickly. You saw it that night, but that was it. If you didn't catch the magic, you didn't catch the magic. I get paid for shows. I show up. I do a job. I leave. There's no real record of me ever having existed. And you can spend a whole career that way. That's why I'm where I'm at. All right, now we're going to change that. Now we're going to have some output. But things like this podcast, things like the Whiskey Brothers, uh, all I've talked ahead of their time. I launched a podcast in 2011 that still continues today. It's allowed me to think through ideas to... I can't tell you how powerful it is to have something that forces you to organize your thoughts once a week. Output, no output, money, no money. It's it's been more valuable than I can explain. And then when you couple that with the fact that I'm I'm watching all these roads converge at the same time. Um, in my career, I have never. This is the truth. I've never been more broke. I have been, but not not in, not in like adult times. Um. I've never had less work on the books than I do now. And I've never had a less concrete uh, knowledge of where exactly this ends up. And I've never been more comfortable sitting in this unknown than I have uh, in the last stretch. There is a, a, a simmering confidence underneath this that I... I have now assembled all the parts. And I get to put the puzzle together and figure this out. And I'm doing it from the shadows of the tall grass right now. I'm going to wait and see where all the animals run. And then I'm going to make a slow, calculated, deliberate walk to the watering hole. I'm going to pour myself a drink. <laughs> ah! It's interesting, man. I was I was talking to another uh, Paul Odo, by the way, a uh, friend of mine, very good artist. Uh, he has a Kickstarter going on right now. If you want some original art, Paul, I know you're watching. You're welcome. Um, we were talking uh, about what this stuff, and I was trying to explain that I in this pause over the last couple of years that I've been working on me, I have I have spent a lot of time backwards engineering what I want. I think that's where the confidence comes from. I'm watching all these people chase the same exact stuffed rabbit around the gray, Greyhound track. They all want it. They don't know what it is. I, I, if, if you ask them to define it, they'll probably give you some weird, I want to be on SNL. I want to host SNL. I want to be on The Daily Show. I want to host the Oscars. I want to, whatever that means. I want a Netflix special. Okay, great. Um, 
but when I ask myself that, like uh, the answer, specials, blah, 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 I want the body of work. I want the recognition, right? I'm in the same place. See me? Yeah, you know, the dude in the roommate situation. But what I really want is autonomy, is freedom. Like every time I get to what I think I want, I make myself chisel down a little further. Why do I want these things? And I get to this root emotion of wanting freedom. I want to get stories out of my head. I want to get ideas out of my head. I want to write them down. I want to become a better writer, a better performer, a better filmmaker. This requires time spent in the trenches, making stuff, learning stuff, talking to people, doing things. That is how I want to spend my day creatively. And to do that, I have to build an infrastructure. To build the infrastructure, I have to build the audience. And to build the audience, I have to sit with myself and decide what kind of audience I want. And I don't want everybody. That's the truth. I don't want to be a catch-all. I don't want to be that guy. I want to make cool shit. And I want to share it with you. And we'll figure it out. <sighs> you guys, uh, is there anything else on here? No, probably not. This is enough. Uh, get yourself some, that was the other thing. Get yourself some friends. Uh, this is on another episode, part of the breakdown. But it's this as I go to promote all of this, this is why I tell you something. Get yourself some friends who aren't aren't in your industry. One of the conversations we were having the other day, my friend pointed out, he goes, who's less likely to share? We were talking about the sharing process and how you, like what actually constitutes good engagement. Someone, you know, just click and retweet or share. You know, the stuff we do every day that's lost all power. Or someone who writes something heartfelt and legitimately finds a way to connect directly with their audience to say, hey, this is a thing I dig, right? So we were talking about that, and he just points out, he goes, he goes, why? He goes, what, how, no comic gains anything from, from enrolling in your success. <laughs> he goes, you got to let that go. And I stopped, and I was like, oh, that's why. All those people before that I listed, I mean, I, I'm reaching out to everyone. I will leave no stone unturned as I get ready to release this special, but it is, if you allow it to be, it can be demoralizing because the people around you in your industry and doing the same things you're doing probably have, because most people have, that zero-sum mindset. And even if it's just subconsciously, they can perceive your win as somehow diminishing from what's available to them. And once I let that go, it's allowed me to mentally maintain a lot of friendships. And it's also going to allow me to mentally um, maintain my own sanity through, through the release of the special. April 2nd, it comes out right here. You guys are the best. Thanks for sticking around. It's the Slade Ham Experiment.